Hey everyone, it's Alex, and today I'm here with my wrap up for May and June of 2020. I know these were a few months away, but I'm still catching up on all my old wrap ups that I missed, what with the pandemic kind of messing up my life. So, um, I have nine books to talk about here. I decided to combine them just because I read five books in May and four books in June, and it seemed like kind of a waste to just do two separate monthly wrap-ups when I could just combine them and have one decent video instead of two two very short ones. So I have nine books to talk about here, of which I have a couple. Yeah, so let's get into it. I don't remember a lot of these books in great amount of details, much like my last wrap-up. It's been several months, um, especially the ones that weren't great. So we're gonna do what we can here and hopefully in the future my wrap-ups will be more detailed and more concise and more just well done, in general. The first book that I read in May was The Night Before by Lisa Jackson. It's the first in one of her romantic suspense series. Um, this book was a ride. <laughs> I have so many feelings on this book. This was one of the most fun books that I have read in a very long time. I gave it two stars, but it was a wild ride and I would, if you like romantic suspense, if you like things that are just like absolutely wild rides and ridiculous and like not good but just like, oh my god, that was a wild ride, I'd recommend picking it up because I have more of her books on my shelf and I am now very excited to get to them. This tells the story of a woman whose husband is murdered or her estranged husband or ex-husband, I'm not sure it's about what their relationship is exactly, but estranged in some way, potentially separated, potentially divorced husband, he gets murdered or potentially commits suicide. And then there are other murders that happen around her. And there's a lot of question of, is she committing these murders? Is her twin sister who's disappeared committing these murders? Who, is she in danger? Is she the killer? Who knows? And there are cops investigating and she has a shrink and like, it doesn't, that description doesn't do this book justice. <laughs> I don't know how to like explain how wild this book is without just like complete spoilers. Um, it was a wild ride. <laughs> I want to just like do a completely spoilery discussion of this because like I have so much to say. Um, I did give it two stars because it was really bad. The romance in it, because it is romantic suspense, was really unhealthy. The romance, I thought it was going to be between her and the cop and I was like, oh, well, this is kind of uncomfortable and like this cop really shouldn't be dating this suspect. That's like really inappropriate and unprofessional and all of that. And then as it goes along, I'm like, oh no, the romantic interest is her therapist who is manipulating her, who's only her therapist because he's looking into what happened to his estranged wife and he's just like lying to her. And oh, oh my God, it was so, oh, it also relies on like one of my least favorite tropes, which is this like the mental illness in thrillers. Like everything happens because of mental illness and then like the it's a romance, so like the ending is all like happily ever after, and that's not a spoiler because like it's a romance novel, it inherently has to have a happily ever after ending, but it was just so poorly done. It was just kind of like the messiest of messy books. There's so much that was wrong, and then the ending was like okay, we're all fine now. And oh, like I don't, I'm trying to like edit myself so I don't just say spoilers, but man, that book was a wild ride. And I, I, I could, I'm excited to read more from her and just like discuss her in depth because if the rest of her books are anything like that one, they're going to be fun. Cause that book was, that book was wild. And then I read You Remind Me of You by Erin Corrigan, which is a poetry memoir about her struggles with depression and specifically eating disorders. I gave this five stars. This was a reread for me. I read this when I was in high school and I thought it was one of the most beautiful books that I'd read. And it's it's told through poetry. It's just her talking about what she went through with her high school boyfriend who tried to kill himself and wound up with brain damage as a result. And it's really, lots of trigger warnings, obviously. It's really dark, but it's so beautifully written. I love her poetry and I'm not one who really usually cares about poetry. I'm not a big poetry reader, but this one was just beautiful. And because it was a reread, I was so concerned that like it wasn't going to be as good as I remember. Like I've grown up a lot in the past 10 years. Like 
what I thought was great when I was 16 is like honestly not great most of the time, but this one was honestly even better than I remembered it. And if you like sort of poetry memoirs and like discussions of mental illness, like eating disorders and suicide specifically, I'd highly recommend this because I do think it's worth the read. And I think she captures mental illness really well and her experiences with it. And she doesn't romanticize it or anything. It's just like what she went through and like her love and her relationships and like how things weren't always easy and how sometimes things were easy when they shouldn't have been. And I just, I, I really, really love this book. And then because I was listening to a lot of audiobooks because I was working at 3 a.m. this month, I believe, um, you get through a lot of audiobooks when you listen to them like five hours a day. I listened to The Night Circus narrated by Jim Dale. Also a reread for me. I gave it four stars. My biggest takeaway from this reread, this is an adult fantasy novel. It's set around the circus. Um, the two magicians are kind of in a competition with each other, like trying to outdo the other. And they're put at it by their masters and the competition just becomes the circus. Like they're doing this magic within the context of this circus and it's just beautifully written and so atmospheric. And I think my biggest takeaway from rereading it was that it's so much better upon reread because the first time I read it, it took me a very long time to get into the book because it took me so long to like figure out what was going on because it's very atmospheric, it's very lyrical, it's a little bit non-linear so it can be a little bit difficult to just like get into and follow it, but it's like because I'd already read it, the second time around I just immediately got into the story and I understood so much from just like page one because like I knew what was happening, I knew what the point was, and I, I, I got so much more from it this time. So this is a book that I do think just gets better with the reread and if you did if you did read it and you had some issues like understanding it, I definitely recommend the second go around just because like I I loved it and I'll definitely be rereading it sometime, although probably not for like a good long while. Then I listened to the audiobook for A Dream About Lightning Bugs by Ben Folds, which is his memoir. I read this already earlier this year. I'll link to my review down below. I'll link to my reviews for all of these down below if I have them. Um, I was disappointed with my read the first time around. I thought the book was kind of dry. I thought Ben Foltz didn't do a great job and he didn't get very personal in it. And it's really hard to read a memoir where the author doesn't get personal because like that's kind of the point. And there was like distance for me. There was a lot of distance and I don't like distance in my memoirs. And I thought maybe listening to the audiobook would help that and like I would enjoy it more. And honestly, I think I kind of enjoyed it less. <laughs> He's, I've heard him speak before, I've seen him in concert a few times, and I, he doesn't have a great reading voice. It felt like he was reading it in a bit of a monotone, just like straight off the page. Like, it was a little bit monotone and just like very dry. <laughs> it took me a minute to get through this book, just was like, I never really wanted to pick it up and listen to it. And there were definitely some things where like, it was good to hear the story in his voice because there was some inflection or emotion, but for the most part, I was, I was disappointed because I really thought listening to his version of the audiobook would be like wonderful and it would make me appreciate the book more, but it was, he's a great musician. I did like reading the book just for like the information's sake, but it's still, it's still three stars for me. It's still just like kind of fine and it's still just kind of a disappointment. And then another reread, I think all of these have been rereads so far, have they? Have they? No, the first, the Lisa Jackson book was not a reread, but the rest of these have been rereads. Um, fun. So I read Going Too Far by Jennifer Eccles, which is a YA contemporary romance about a girl who falls in love with a cop and they have a lot of issues because she's a rebel with blue hair and the cop is very uptight on the straight and narrow and she has a lot of anxiety issues and does drugs and like goes out and does illegal things and Basically, she winds up getting stuck on an overnight shift with the cop, like every every night, five days a week, um, for her spring break, and she winds up falling in love with him, as you know, you do. <laughs> and it's, I gave this three stars. I loved this when I was fourteen. When I was fourteen, this book was amazing. This book was like everything I wanted to be in my life. And now I'm twenty six, and I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> This is what I liked when I was 14. I don't, this is what 14 year olds like. 14 year olds want their protagonist to have blue hair because she's a rebel. And like, 
it does mention that she has blue hair like every other page because she's a rebel. It's the romance is not well done. It's weird that she's 17 and he's like a cop and he's young. He's like 19 or 20, but it's still like a weird power dynamic that makes me uncomfortable. Like it's not the age difference. I mean, it is if he's like 20, but like, it's not really the age difference. It's the power dynamic. And it's so, I don't know, that's uncomfortable. And there's just a lot of melodrama in this like unnecessary melodrama, just like lots of tears, lots of like, oh no, you'll never understand and just running away. And like, <laughs> it's so over the top and it's not well written. And I don't know. I love this when I was 14. If you like cheesy contemporary YA romances, you might like it, but I'm keeping it because of how much I loved it 10 years ago, but I don't love it today. So, um, I'm just gonna, I'll probably reread it at some point in the future just to remind myself because there still is nostalgia in this book for me. Like, it's not great. It's not good. I have so many issues with it, but, oh, it still, it still hits that little nostalgic, like, I do kind of love this a little bit, but like, not really. Um, so I am glad I bought myself a copy just because like the library doesn't have one anymore. And this is one I'm going to want to return to just because of how many times I read it at age 14, because that's who I was at 14. <laughs> um, but yeah, this one was kind of just like, I'd give it a pass. Then because I was clearly in a mood, um, I read By Your Side by Casey West, which I gave three stars, but a much happier three stars, I think. Um, this is a YA contemporary romance about a girl who gets trapped in a library with a cute boy who's kind of a loner, outcast, possibly into bad things, but like really has a heart of gold because, you know, they always do in books. Um, and then it follows them after they come out of the library because they're trapped there for like a holiday weekend. And it's, it's a cute fluffy romance and I don't really have any complaints on this one. Like it was only three stars because like I think cute fluffy romances aren't really ever going to be highly rated for me even if they're really well done because I do struggle to connect with them. But this one I really liked. If you like cute fluffy romances I, I highly recommend this. Um, it was well done. I love the part when they were trapped in the library together. That was so cute. It was so just like everything you wanted it to be, as fluffy as you wanted it to be. For me, it got a little weird once they were out of the library. I don't think it was necessarily handled as well as it could have been. They threw in a couple of weird elements, like there was this weird car crash and like people were in the hospital and it was just like, I don't necessarily want that kind of serious drama in a book that th that's this like cute and fluffy. Like you can discuss serious topics and like, have a little gravitas without just being like, oh, this person might be dead. It's like, oh, that was like, I got like halfway through this book of them like being trapped in this library and flirting with each other and like sharing their coat. <laughs> and like, it just, that was like a weird element to throw in. But I don't know. I, I like it. I think if you like, if you like this kind of thing, I, I can't imagine you wouldn't like this book because it's, it's cute. And then the last thing I read was also a reread, so like two of nine were new to me in these two months, but you know, sometimes you just need to reread books. Um, Family of Strangers by Susan Beth Pfeffer. This is a young adult contemporary epistolary novel about a young girl who is suicidal. Um, she lives in an, she has a, she lives in an abusive household. She has two older sisters who are out of the house. Her father's a very abusive, angry man, and her mother is kind of not around. And this book is told by Abby, who is the youngest daughter. It's told in letters she writes to her sister and her sister writes back. It's told in diary entries. It's told in practice essays that she's writing to, for college. It's told in her last will and testament. Basically anything she writes down gets put into this book. And it's really interesting and well done and just like really heartbreaking. I gave it five stars. <laughs> I've read this so many times. This is another one of those books that I read a million times from the library and then the library got rid of their copy and I was just like, oh, I need to, need to buy myself one. <laughs> and I finally did and just like, it's as good as I remember. It's better than I remember. It's such a small story. Like it's, it doesn't feel melodramatic. It just feels like, hey, she's in this bad situation, but she's kind of dealing with it. Like it's not over the top. It's not like she's about to die. She's just kind of like in a kind of crappy situation and she's, trying to learn to live with it. She's trying to learn to exist because she's, you know, 16, 17. 
it's sweet in a way. Like, it's really dark, it's really sad at points, but it's also, like, a kind of sweet, wholesome book. I don't know. I would really recommend it. I love the writing style in this. I love the way it's written. I love the letters and the epistolary format. I think it's, it's so, so good. And I love the way she just just starts learning to deal with her situation and starts learning to take control where she can. It's just, it's, it's really well done, I think. And I would, I would highly recommend this book if you're interested in this kind of thing. It's a bit older. It's definitely like from the 90s, but it, it's, it's just so well done and I adore it. So let me know down below if you've read any of these books and what you thought of them if you have. And as always, thank you all so much for watching and I will see y'all again soon.